Amen. All right. So why don't we start in John chapter 3 this morning. John chapter 3. And uh, these texts will not be unfamiliar. These, they're, they're not some great big shocking, you know, magical truth that only your pastor knows. No, but we have to talk about them and, and maybe contextualize in the sense of what's, there's so much you could study when you look at John 3. We're looking at John 3. We're looking at John 4. We're going to be in Acts there's so many different things you can study. You can study verse by verse. There's all different kinds of topics you can look at. And so today we're looking through the lens of how to have a spiritual conversation with someone about their soul. And so in John chapter 3, let's start. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night said unto him, Rabbi, or teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So the Pharisees, at this point we know the Pharisees were against Jesus. They did not believe he was the Messiah. They did not believe he was legitimate. He did not get their permission to be the son of God or to be the Messiah, and they decided that they should be the ones to decide. They decided he wasn't it. They were against Jesus. But there was a little group of them headed up by Nicodemus that believed. And Nicodemus was enthralled by Jesus, and he comes to him under the cover of darkness because it wasn't safe for a man in his position to be associating with Jesus. So he kind of comes out... Uh, you know, with the mask of darkness and says, basically, Jesus, some of us have come to the conclusion that because you are doing these things, God has to be with you. So there has been much theological debate, but we have decided that because of what you've done, then, then God has to have sent you. So let's look at the situation. Number one, you might say, well, I'm not Jesus. No, none of us is Jesus. However, we are, as Christians, to grow and to become more and more Christ-like. See, Nicodemus came wanting to speak to Jesus. Now, again, we're not Jesus. However, you know what? We should have a kind of testimony in our relationship of friends, in our relationship of family, where they know, like, you're the spiritual guy or gal. You're the one that studies the Bible. You're the one that knows spiritual things. You're the one that prays, goes to prayer meeting, goes to church. Like, you should have the kind of testimony that, like, I can come talk to this person about spiritual things. So number one is to have a good spiritual conversation with somebody, you got to have the kind of testimony where they know that you're, you're spiritual. At least in this case, that's what's going on. Also, notice the time that he comes. Nicodemus sneaks out and approaches him at night. And you might be thinking, well, psh, I got my shows on, Nicodemus. Like, the day's over. Like, I was busy all day long. I worked from A to B. I did C and D. I've had dinner. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I can get my foot off the stool right now, Nicodemus. Why don't you come back tomorrow at a more convenient time for me? And then maybe we can talk about your spirit. Nope, none of that's happening, right? I mean, when we study the word of God through, we see verses like be instant in season and out of season. Be always ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. You know what? You need to be approachable and you need to be ready even at really strange and inconvenient, perhaps, times to share your faith. Like, that's a dream to me. If someone would come to me with a spiritual question, that's what I pray for. I say, God, we live in a world right now in the West, in America, in Maine. Maine always, by the way, when you, when you look at any polling data about religiosity. Woo, big word for the day. If you look at any polling data about spirituality, church going, Christians, uh, you know, prayer, like Maine always finishes bottom five. Bottom two or three a lot of times. In every category, Maine is like low, bottom five, 
in the whole nation about people that care or not about spiritual things, about God, about church, etc. So like we know, like people don't care. They got their they got their jobs, they got their families, they got a beer in the fridge, they got a game on TV. What else do I need? Hunting, ice fishing, racing. Whatever, there's, the world's got tons of stuff for you to just go have fun doing and you never, ever, ever have to think about sin, about God, about righteousness, about eternity, about heaven, about hell, all of these important, real, spiritual ideas. So, I, so like most of the time, people don't care. And so I pray, God, help me to run across someone that cares to ask a spiritual question to want to know things of the Spirit. And that's a good way to pray, by the way. And then when it finally happens, I'm going to, like, I jump through the roof. Like, whoa, this is exciting. Someone actually asked me a spiritual way. It was the middle of the night. But you know what? That's what I've been praying for. And you've got to be ready when these things come. Now, I want you to notice how Jesus answers him. Because in verse 2, this is less about, I'm all in on my faith. Jesus, about you being the Messiah. And this is more about a group of us have made a theological decision that because of the things that you're doing, God has to be with you. That's not all that committal in verse 2. And Jesus answered in verse 3 and said unto him, Verily, verily, that's truly, truly, that's actually amen twice. Whenever, in your scripture, whenever you see verily, verily, in the Greek, it's amen, amen. And so we, but that's how you would translate it. Truly, truly, of a truth, of, a, of the ultimate truth. When you see verily, verily, we're dealing with a very important truth statement. I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I love our English see here because you've got a double meaning. Like when you can't, you don't even get to see it. You don't get to see heaven unless you get born again. But there's also the idea here of understand. You know when someone explains something that you don't, you're not quite solid on and you kind of have the light bulb goes on and you go, oh, I see, right? That moment of understanding. That, both of these ideas show up here. You don't get to see heaven unless you're born again. You're not going to understand the spiritual things of God unless you get born again. So Jesus basically... He does not enter into the conversation in the place where Nicodemus started it. This isn't about theology. It's not about debate. He says, Nicodemus, you don't really know anything at all. You called me teacher. I'm not just a teacher. I'm the son of God. I'm the promised Christ. I'm the Messiah. If you knew something, you'd know that I'm the Messiah that was promised to come. Uh, and so he says, unless you get born again, Nicodemus, you're not going to really understand what's happening spiritually right now. And so one of the things we need to do, perhaps, when we're in a... Because don't you know, when someone comes at you with a spiritual question, they have all kinds of like pre-existing mental and spiritual baggage uh, from whence they are asking their question. They maybe have a bunch of suppositions, presuppositions, and so, and so he cuts through the mustard and says, well, first and foremost, let me say this. You must be born again. Right? Isn't that important for us to let people know? Like, well, you know, I went to church and I helped a friend the other day. And, and I really, you know, I even prayed to God the other day. And then this idea where they think that they're kind of spiritual enough to maybe, you know, scooch their way in. And Jesus says, clean slate. You've got to be born again. There's a spiritual event that needs to take place. Like this sort of hemming around the edges isn't going to work. There really is no understanding God until we get born again. The kingdom of God. You understand that God has a kingdom, an authority structure, a throne, a spiritual kingdom. I don't want to study the kingdom, the, the kingdom idea too much today. But broadly speaking, the kingdom of God is the rule of our eternal sovereign God over all the universe. He is, that's why we see the word Lord showing up in scripture so much. Jesus is Lord. Lord of what? Lord of the kingdom. God is his father. The father, the son, the Holy Spirit. 
God rules over all. He does not always exercise personal and immediate action in every dynamic of his kingdom. You understand he actually sets people up in his authority structures. You know, we have in America, we have a constitution. We have branches of government. And God has allowed them to have authority in this earth, in this country, over us. You know when the police officer puts his lights on and pulls you over and walks up with his badge? All of that is meant to be a signifier of an authority structure. And you are not in charge when he walks over to your car and says, license and registration, please. You do not get to say, well, yeah, but the Constitution, <laughs> as you get tased and yanked out of your car. You'll find out who's in charge real quick. So we understand, like, physically kingdoms, but spiritually there's a kingdom, too, that's reflected in the physical world. And God is the king over the kingdom. Jesus Christ is Lord of the kingdom. The kingdom is spiritual. Uh, Jesus in John 18 said his kingdom was not of this world. In Matthew 4, he preached that repentance is necessary to be part of the kingdom of God. So an event has to happen before you're actually part of the kingdom of God. It's the new birth. This confuses Nicodemus. So Jesus makes a truth statement. Okay, all these spiritual talk and theological debate, Nicodemus, let's cut right through. Have you been born again? Have you? you can ask people, have you been born again? And see what happens. They'll either understand or they'll get real confused. They may understand on an intellectual level. They may understand on a personal level because they've received Christ and they've been born again. But if, they, if you're sitting here today and you don't understand the, the idea that you've got to be born again to be part of the kingdom of God, well, maybe today is your day to get born again. Today could be your day to get born again. But Nicodemus here is confused. Verse 4, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the a second time into the mother's womb and be born. So this man has like no spiritual discernment right now. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, it's important to read all of those verses together. If you looked at verse 5 in isolation, you might be tempted to say, oh, okay, so I've got, I've got to be water baptized to be born again. And, and there are many that erroneously teach this, by the way. But the context of this is, if you look at verse 4, 5, and 6, two births, a physical birth and a spiritual birth. Uh, if you've ever been around a physical birth, then you know that there is a lot of water. <laughs> there is a, there's a lot of water going on with a physical birth. Uh, and so uh, because of the context, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. We've all been born once of the flesh. Have you been born again? See, and you can have this kind of conversation with people if you've been born again. If you're not sure about it for yourself, well, you've still got to deal with that. Uh, personally. We've all been born of the flesh. Have you been born of the spirit? And Nicodemus must have been looking at Jesus like he was crazy because Jesus continues in verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. Okay, so part of Jesus's explanatory process here is he uses something from nature and shows how it mirrors something of the spirit. There are plenty of things in nature that we can use to teach spiritual truths, especially here the wind, the wind here. There's a natural occurring phenomenon whereby Jesus teaches a spiritual truth. You can look outside right now and say, is it windy? What do you think? Can you see any trees or branches out there? I see trees and branches, but I don't see any branches moving right now. Do you? Maybe when a car goes by. 
But when I'm looking outside right now, I'm not outside. I don't know, no. But I can look at the branches. The branches aren't moving. And I can say, you know what, it's not windy out. Right? Now, we, uh, if you were looking outside and the branches were doing this, you'd say, it is so windy outside, even though you're not there. Right? Because you can see the effect of the wind on the object, even when you can't see the wind. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit of God. You can see the Spirit affects the movement of the person that, it is, that he is filling if you are a spirit-filled person, you're going to move and act differently than you did without the spirit. You're going to make different choices now that you have the spirit of God than you made before. Not that you're going to be perfect and there will be battles and struggles. I smoked a pack a day until I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal savior when I was 24. And you know what? The first few days were really rough on this new Christian. And so that's not saying like, oh, you must not be saved. You cheated and had a cigarette. No, I'm fighting a battle right now, okay? Uh, we understand that. So like, the thing is, if you're not a Christian, like, you don't care. You don't care. You're not gonna fight that battle because you don't care, unless like you've been convinced by a family member who's pressuring you, or you watch the news again where someone else got lung cancer. Like, so those things like could affect you. But I mean, on a spiritual level, when you see that what that is is a sin, like you don't care if you're lost and you don't have the spirit. But if you've got the spirit, see, you're gonna start to move different and that's gonna be like a battle for you that you're gonna wanna go through. Just an example, okay? And so, how can we prove that God, who is invisible, exists? Well, we don't need to prove anything, number one. But we do get born again by faith, and then we allow him to move us by the guiding of his Holy Spirit, especially as we study the Word and learn about his character and his truth. And then we learn his ways, and we allow his precepts to guide us, and then the world sees a person, you, or a group of people, church, doing something completely different than what they're doing, and they say, well, why do you do that? You know what happened? They noticed the Spirit moving something, and it elicited in their lives a question, the question being why. When you get a why question, you are right in the arena of, I can have a spiritual conversation and I can brag on my God and I can brag on my Savior and I can tell them why is because I've trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I've been born again by the Spirit of God. I'm trying to be what God wants me to be and I am so imperfect and I know that and I don't think I'm better than you. I just think I want to be what God wants me to be and that's why. The answer, you know, naturally was we saw what the wind was doing. We apply that spiritually. We see what God is doing because of the effects that he has on others. Nicodemus is still confused. Nine. Answered and said unto Jesus, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Oh, Nicodemus, you've got a position. You've got a position of teacher in the temple. How do you not understand? So he calls him on the carpet a little bit. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye, Pharisees, receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. You want a head-spitting twister? Look at verse 13. What are we talking about? Jesus said, basically, that he came down from heaven and he is in heaven at the same time. You say, well, I don't get that. Well, join the club. Other than power of God, Jesus can be incarnate in several different ways. But basically, Nicodemus is saying, how can the spiritual world operate this way? And Jesus says, Remember earlier how I said, except you be born again, you can't understand the kingdom of God? 
and now you're saying that you're a teacher, but you don't understand what I'm saying? That's a challenge for Nicodemus to consider himself. You know, you know what? Sometimes people are really hard to reach because they think they already know something. We can be the same way. Pride of heart. We've decided, I already know the answer to these questions. And then someone comes along and gives you some different answers than you expected. You have to go, ah. Self-examination time. Now look at this, verse 14 and 15. This is actually Jesus quoting Numbers 21. And he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and read Numbers 21. You can read this story for yourself if you want. But this is three verses amidst all the history of Israel. And don't forget, Israel was a group of people that had the, the promises of God, they had the oracles of God, they had Moses, they had, I mean, the, the burning bush, they had the law, they, they had the fire by night, they had the cloud by day, they had manna from heaven every day, but they would get upset when they had to endure. We're sick and tired. At one point, they're starving in the wilderness. They get manna every day. And then at another point, they come along and they said, we're sick and tired of this manna every day. Right? That's, that's, that's unregenerated man. You know, we take for granted everything God has given us. Oh, really? There's only three pepperonis on this pizza. Right? Oh, I complain about everything. But what happens is this. Because they complained to God about having to eat manna every day, God said, oh, let me show you what else could happen. And he sent in their midst a group of poisonous, fiery serpents that were biting the people in the desert, and they were dropping dead. And it was a horrible plague. And so, you know, oh, so you're going to complain about the manna? Let me show you what else could happen. Right? Oh, man, it could always be so much worse. But so what happened was, is the people are literally dying from all these poisonous snakes. And so Moses and Joshua approach God and say, what do we do? And he goes, I want you to build a pole. And on the pole, because they're being bitten by serpents, I want you to put on here a serpent. And by the way, that serpent on a pole, that's where we get our caduceus insignias. If you've seen in the medical field today, where you see the snake wrapped around the pole, they got that from Numbers 21. And he says, and God does something, he did something in Numbers 21 he'd never done before. Take a pole, and it was the kind of pole that you would hang an army banner on, or a standard. Probably had a crossbar. Probably looked a lot like a cross. They put on it a serpent of brass. Now a lot of times when we think of a serpent, we think uh, the symbolism of the devil. Like the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And that is true, but that's not always true. Here, it was not. It was a snake because they were being bitten by snakes. And so, that which is lifted up on the pole is in antithesis to that which was killing people. And sin is killing us today, friends. And Christ became sin on the cross when he bore the sins of mankind in his body. But what God is doing when he has the serpent on the pole and lifts it up, and he, said, he just says this real simple thing. He says, tell the people, look and live. We, we actually have a hymn. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It's recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. And that was taken from Numbers 21, the situation with all the people dying by the poisonous snakes. And so let me ask you, put yourself in the position of the Jew in the moment. Okay? You, maybe you were one of the complainers. Man, sick and tired of being out here and eating manna every day. And you know your attitude's wrong all of a sudden because here come the snakes. And people are dying. And maybe, maybe someone close to you gets bit and dies. Now it's pretty real, right? Now it's pretty real. And God raises up this symbol, this 
serpent on a brass pole, and you are told, if you just go to that brass pole and look at it, you'll live. And I imagine you'd be a little skeptical at first. Because anything that involves faith also has an opportunity for skepticism. So what is looking at that stupid poll going to do? Do you remember Naaman the leper? Elisha told him, go wash in the Jordan seven times. And you'll be healed of your leprosy. Naaman said, well, pfft. This Jordan River, this thing looks like a puddle compared to the river I've got in my backyard in Syria. What's washing in that seven times going to do? So you might be real skeptical. You might think, what will that do? Now what happens if you get bit? What happens if you get bit? Think you're going to ignore the serpent on the pole now? Desperate, afraid, no other place to turn. You run to that lifted up serpent and you look at it. What do you think you're doing while you look at that serpent and you've got a fresh snake bite on your arm? Think you're praying maybe? You're saying, oh God, I am so sorry that I complained. I am here in front of your lifted up serpent and I'm looking. <laughs> I imagine there'd be some repentance, there'd be some faith, there'd be some obedience, there'd be some prayer. And then you wait. And you just wait. What's going to happen? Am I going to turn blue and fall down dead? Nope. Trusted God, you obeyed God. Perfect health. A clean slate. A fresh chance. Almost like you've been born again. That's why we can see Jesus would use this example in the very uh, you must be born again passage. And so here we find Jesus uses Old Testament scriptures and uses them as an example of his grace and forgiveness and triumph over sin and death. And so we're in John 3, and then we have that famous verse where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so here in this conversation with Nicodemus, a man who thought he knew something but didn't know anything at all, a man who snuck out by night, he says, you must be born again. He connected that to the Son of Man being lifted up. And so basically he was telling them how he was going to die on the cross with this example. His death, his resurrection, and now the Spirit of God can regenerate us. And here we understand what God's love is. John 3, 16. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. And so God's love is bound up in his son Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of his son Jesus Christ for us. And if we reject Jesus Christ, we cannot access the love of God. And so here, I think you, these are important ideas in dealing with a person about their soul. And these are ideas that we can learn from how John dealt with Nicodemus in chapter 3, explaining the need for a new spiritual birth, showing people that that can only be accessed by Jesus Christ, who is the expression of God's love. Amen. You ready to do that? Let's look at another one. John 4. John 4. Jesus is passing through Samaria. And we have this famous portion of scripture called the women at the well. And why don't we just jump right down to verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, 
being a Jew, askest drink of me, which I'm a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So here we have a cultural situation. Right away. Now notice this. Nicodemus sought Jesus by night in this last one, in chapter 3. But here in John chapter 4, Jesus puts himself in a place where he's going to run into this woman, or she's going to run into him. 